Thank you so much for joining us today, Kylie. I am particularly intrigued to find out how somebody can move from journalism through to tech advocacy. What was that journey for you? My passion is storytelling and I am absolutely fascinated by science and technology and these two things I think have always coexisted for me. So as a journalist I was obsessed with science stories and medical stories and breakthroughs and in fact before I left journalism I was the national medical correspondent for Australian Associated Press. So it was a natural segue for me to move into the world of advocacy for medicine and from there science and technology. I have described myself as Australia's biggest professional fan of science and technology. I would second that. Right? I, I mean, and what a privilege that. to have a career based on that fandom. And every day I'm learning about extraordinary work that we're doing here that our researchers and the people who apply that knowledge are doing in Australia and beyond. And every day I have the privilege of meeting those people and learning from them and, and about them. So telling their stories is really what I still do. I'm not a journalist anymore, but I am an advocate. And in order to advocate, successfully for investment, for um, the regulatory environment, for the legislative environment, for the conditions and the infrastructure that we need in order to thrive as an up and coming. And I believe we're still not at our pinnacle in Australia. We've got, a, we've got some success to come as an up and coming science and technology superpower. And we can do that, I think, but in order to do that advocacy at its core is storytelling and creating those connections for people. So yeah, STEAM versus STEM, arts versus science, it, it, it's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all part of a continuum. Technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Technology exists in order to be put to service by humanity. That's why we created it. We can't consider it as something separate to us and nor should we. So I've heard you talk in the past about a particularly personal journey that you made into loving STEM. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So just before my 36th birthday, I was diagnosed with end-stage cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had a football-sized tumour in my pelvis. I was already at that stage working in advocacy for science and technology, but I think an experience like that, and it took, I am well, I <laughs> got through the other side, but an experience like that really um, pairs down to its core what you really need, what you really believe in and what you really stand for. And for me, there were a couple of things that really came through very strongly. Firstly, I literally wouldn't be here if it wasn't for science and technology and the application of that research. I literally wouldn't be alive. I'm incredibly fortunate to be here in this place in this time. And we're, in for we're fortunate to have you here as well. Oh, well, thank you. But 11 years on, I'm, I'm healthy and I'm well and, and I am one of the lucky ones. And there are some people who are not so lucky, which is why I've made it I've redoubled my efforts, I've redoubled my passion since that time and really focused all of my energy on ensuring that I'm not the only lucky one. I know I'm privileged. I live in a, a pretty wealthy society by global standards. I have access to, to world best health care, as do you. But there are many, many people around the world who don't enjoy that. There are many people in our own country who don't enjoy that. And there is an extraordinary amount of excellent research waiting to happen that doesn't get funded, that hasn't been able to be translated. That for one reason or another, because of the system, because of um, the, the funding pool that's available, because of the priorities of, of uh, the companies or the governments, doesn't come to fruition. So it's my mission to make sure that we do everything we can to provide the environment for that really great, incredible, world-changing science and technology to be done and to be applied, and for us all to enjoy the benefits. So if Australia is almost at this pinnacle of success, what are the major barriers that are stopping us from getting there? We've done some really incredible stuff and a lot of those stories aren't told. I mean, we all talk about Wi-Fi and black box and, and ultrasound and there are um, a lot of those things came from the CSIRO, of course. But there are a lot of a lot of technologies that do go under the radar as well. And, um, you know, we, we're helping deaf people around the world here through Australian technology, for example. What do we need? Well, the opportunity is immense. We have a unique position in Australia. We are still a young nation in terms of, you know, Australia as it is now, as well as an incredibly ancient nation. We have the opportunity both to incorporate ancient knowledge and understanding about sustainability and how we interact with the planet with modern technology and thinking and modern scientific techniques and application. That is an extraordinary position that we're in, an extraordinary and unusual position of privilege globally. Um, we also have geographic 
isolation and that has been really brought home over the last 18 months of course as travel has, has shut down around the world. That's a challenge but it's also an opportunity and it's driven a lot of our, um, our innovation in the past. It can continue to drive a lot of our innovation in the future. Geographically we're at a, a pretty um, vulnerable position for climate change and that also is an opportunity. We can be the global leader uh, when it comes to applying uh, clean energy technologies, electrification of the transportation systems and freight systems, the continuous and safe delivery of electricity and healthcare and internet and other sophisticated technology to remote communities. It's something that we ought to excel at because we have this opportunity to be a gigantic experiment and then export it to the world. So sitting inside the context of tech in Australia, what has been your personal journey? Well, um, here at the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, I have uh, the fortunate opportunity to work with 900 of Australia's leading experts in applied science, technology and engineering. And that, that's an extraordinary that's network. That's a busy day. It's a pretty busy day, <laughs> but it's a big opportunity, isn't it? Because these people are leading companies, they're leading government departments, they're leading initiatives, they're on boards, they're leading research organisations, obviously, as well. And if you bring, if you harness the power of that leadership and you bring that multidisciplinary perspective, as well as that experience in management, oversight, governance, policy, application of infrastructure, you if you synthesise all of those skills and all of that knowledge, that's something that, that I can play a small part in facilitating. The fellows are incredibly committed to public good. They see their fellowship of the academy as social service. They donate their expertise with extraordinary generosity so that we can bring together those different perspectives and that different knowledge and present solutions to the government, to businesses, to investors. So my personal role in doing that is it's really as a connector. I'm not the expert, but I have access to so many experts and I think I'd be negligent if I didn't join those dots and bring people together to be able to uh, make more of what they could do as an individual to really kind of amplify their potential. So the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts when we look always. at Australia's capability globally. Always, always. And it's, you know, they, I think there's there's been an interesting discussion in academia in recent years about interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, this idea that lots of different people with different perspectives uh, can and should get together to problem solve. Diversity is important because it gives us strength. If we have a lot of people who've got the same background, the same qualifications, working on a problem, the same solutions will keep coming up. If we have a lot of people with different backgrounds, different qualifications, different experiences of life, then we have extraordinary strength and capability and creativity and new solutions can flourish. So on this journey, what have been your proudest moments? It's actually very hard to pick one. Um, which is it's a lovely thing to be able That's to say. That's a good right? problem. Yeah. But there are a couple that really stand out and one of them's maybe a little bit more public and one of them's maybe a little bit less public. So I'd like to tell you about both of them. So the government had threatened to defund our critical research infrastructure, the big kit. And what I was able to do was rally the big organisations, the academies, the lobby groups, the advocates and the, and the peak bodies, as well as the heads of major national agencies to take a coordinated coordinated approach in a very short period of time, over a couple of weeks, to run a public campaign, a private political campaign, and to really unite around uh, a message to say, if you do this, you will rob Australia of its future. To really bring home the import of continued investment in that infrastructure, not just to build new stuff, but to keep the stuff we've got going and to ensure that it's open and functioning so that researchers can access it and use it. So it's not uh, perhaps as sexy as some of the, the other achievements, but turning that, that around within two weeks, that was a really proud moment. Something uh, perhaps a little bit shinier than that, uh, but no less important, and that's the superstars of STEM. Again, it was, I think it was 2016, 2017, when the idea came to me to create this program. The superstars of STEM is, uh, it does a couple of things, but it, it's, real aim, its central aim is to convince girls and young women that there's a place in science, technology, engineering and mathematics for them, that there are exciting careers, that there are people like them 
in STEM. It's meant to be a culture changer, a game changer, but it also actually helps individuals along the way. It started with 30, there are now 60 um, women in STEM from a whole range of different career stages, a range of different ages, a range of different disciplines, sectors. They come from all over Australia and they represent as much diversity as we could manage to pack into that program. So gender and uh, sexuality diversity, there's cultural diversity, there are people who have uh, um, or are working with or care for people with disability. It's really designed to find um, as many people who have different attributes and skills and backgrounds so that any person, any girl, any young woman can look at this group and find someone that they identify with, someone who looks or sounds like them or who comes from a similar background to them. And working with these women, each one of them skilled communicators, each one of them passionate about making a difference and inspiring girls and women in STEM, supporting them with skills development, teaching them how to make speeches, teaching them how to advocate with decision makers, teaching them how to speak to the media with confidence and build their, their social media profile, uh, encouraging, supporting them and giving them skills to go into schools and connect directly with school students, essentially transforming them overnight into public figures. Mm -hmm not just with the skills, but with the opportunities. The program requires them to do all of the things I've just spoken about, but also gives them the opportunity to do those things. So it sets them up with those opportunities. And also with the networks through a, a curated mentoring program, but also through introductions to decision makers um, in all kinds of sectors, political, business, social. The idea is that they become very public role models, very visible role models, very relatable role models and skilled advocates for women in STEM. So that collectively, you know, now that we're onto the third cohort of the program, that's, uh, where are we up to? 170 people, and 100 and I can't add up. <laughs> We've got 180 superstars of STEM yeah. and counting. And every single one of them has a media profile. Every single one of them has a social media profile. Every single one of them goes into schools and makes speeches. Every single one of them speaks on stages. And every single one of them speaks with decision makers, people of influence. And they all do it with confidence. And many of the first, first cohort are now mentoring the latest cohort, which is wonderful. One of the um, most beautiful benefits from that program, and it was completely unanticipated for me, was that um, the participants had the opportunity to connect with each other and to become each other's cheerleaders, to become an extraordinary, varied team. As a result of that, they're starting new businesses together and they're creating new research initiatives together and they're problem solving from that perspective of diversity that we've spoken about, where all of them have different experiences professionally, Many of them have very, very different experiences personally, but they're united through these really key things, a commitment and a passion to supporting girls and women to enter and stay and thrive in STEM, an ability to communicate and a passion for storytelling. And now a commitment to each other as well. Mm. They lift each other, which is an, it's, it's an amazing thing to do. It's a wonderful do. program. And I think the more the merrier, you know. Mm. Historically, um, women and girls have been pitted against each other, mm -hmm. and I think that's been, uh, if not a conscious, a very deliberate tactic to exclude. Mm. So empowering women to connect and support each other and to lift each other up, that's really important. So where do you get your personal drive from in terms of diversity and technology? I've always been a bit of a troublemaker, Kath. I don't like to be... <laughs> That's why I like you. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've always seen myself as someone who's a little bit less normal, I suppose, um, for various reasons. But um, but that that's really been my impetus. I, I think I see things a little bit differently to a lot of people, and I always have. And I, I think those who have come through trauma such as, you know, major illness, terminal illness, and survived it, you either become more vulnerable or you become stronger and more determined. And that's what's happened for me. I've become stronger and more determined. I am not just a survivor, I am a thriver. And I think that I have an obligation, given that I have privilege, given that I am in an extraordinarily privileged position as part of the Academy of Technology and Engineering and the jobs that I've had before this, as a middle-class white woman in a middle-class society, for the most part, in a wealthy nation, I have extraordinary privilege. I see it as an obligation. It would be remiss of me. It would be, uh, it would be a neglect of duty for me not to use that privilege for good. How do we get more women and girls into STEM? Big question, big answer. It's not very straightforward, unfortunately. <laughs> but there are a couple of really key elements, I think, to uh, to making it work. One is we need that structural reform. We need to uh, to break the system, change it, and to make it one that 
genuinely supports people with lots of different needs and lots of different family situations and lots of different backgrounds to be part of it and to thrive in it and to succeed in it. We also need to have role modelling. We need to really provide opportunities for people like you and your peers to tell your stories, to talk about your motivations, to demonstrate why it's exciting to have a career in STEM and how you can succeed, to, de to demonstrate that you can succeed and that you have every right to be there and you can assume that you have every right to be there. So storytelling and role modelling is really, really important too. We also need career stewardship. We need to take responsibility as leaders, both you and I and all of the other leaders in STEM, regardless of their gender, we need to take responsibility for personally stewarding the careers of promising individuals. And that means not just making sure that you've got gender equity on your board, not just making sure that you have diversity in your recruitment round. It means personally taking an interest and ensuring that once we've got those people in our organisations, we predicate them for success. We give them the tools, the culture, the environment, the connections and the nurturing that they need to thrive. What does success look like for you on a personal level? For me personally, it looks like people feel welcome, people feel included, people feel empowered, most particularly to tell their stories and to take a seat at the, the decision-making table. Um, people from genders or from groups that have been marginalised. That's, that's my personal marker of success. Whether that's an individual, whether that looks like um, nurturing a staff member into a new career, or whether it's on a grander scale. And, you know, we're looking at having gender balance on the big decision-making councils and, uh, and boards and governments. That's, that's success, personally, for me. So if I said, diversity in STEM, solved. What does the world look like for you? Well, firstly, we don't talk about women in STEM. We don't talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in STEM. We just talk about scientists and technologists, engineers, mathematicians, health practitioners. That's all we're talking because they're just people, yes. right? They're not, they're not particular kinds of people. They're not defined by their qualities or their background or their gender. They're defined by their intellectual rigour, by their work. And that's really what it should be, right? Mm -hmm. But because of that, because of that, we have supercharged our problem solving capacity. We have absolutely uh, made the most of the brilliance and the brains that we have on tap here in Australia. And we've got an extraordinary amount of brilliance and brains. And it, you know, one of the wonderful things about being a multicultural country is that we've got people who have all kinds of experiences from all around the world, who've been brought up with all kinds of values and, uh, and goals and ideas bringing those people together and having a, a really diverse STEM workforce, whether that's in research or in the private sector or in the public sector making our policy, our regulation, our legislation. Having all of those people working together means that we have a, an opportunity to supercharge, to fast track our problem solving on really big, important stuff that affects all of us. And you know, what is bigger than climate change? Mm. If we don't solve that one, there's not there's gonna no be anything point. else to solve. No. So having all of those people with those different perspectives, those different ideas, those different life experiences coming together, as well as obviously those different disciplines and, and expertise, having them coming together and working together, we're gonna to get there much quicker. Mm. So whose responsibility actually is it for us to have diversity in STEM? It's everybody's responsibility. There's been this assumption that it's women's work. Mm. We see that reflected in, in federal parliament as well, don't we? With all of the, the challenges that have been going on in, in, the, um, in parliament house this year, there's this assumption that it's women's job or it's the marginalised person's job to fix the problem. If they're feeling like an outsider, they've got to shove their way in and keep proving their right to be there. That's actually not going to fix it. We've been doing that for decades, more than decades. We've been doing it for a century. And it's still not fixed it. And we know that if we keep going the current way that we've been going, it's going to be years and years and years before we achieve gender parity at pay, not just in STEM, but as a broader society. At our academy, um, and like every other Leonard Academy, we only induct 25 new fellows a year, and we've got 900 fellows. If we keep doing it the same way that we've been doing it, we're not going to achieve gender parity in a hurry. It's going to take a very long time. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're about to completely change the way that we elect fellows. There has to be a level of excellence and a high bar to meet. What we are doing, though, is very deliberately and proactively encouraging and supporting women to nominate. And we're encouraging and teaching the people who are doing the assessment how to look beyond gender, how to look beyond career breaks, because women are much more likely to have them, and to, to really hone into achievement and potential and excellence with all of those um, assumptions 
and prejudices and stereotypes taken off the table. In order to get rid of those assumptions and those prejudices and stereotypes, we need diversity at the decision-making table. 